We throw in another wrinkle in things this morning, so I get to hold on to two things here and do all of this. I have no idea what I'm going to do with my hands now. This is, those of you that don't know me. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can get them open to um, Matthew chapter 25. We're going to be in there in a little bit and talk about these principles of stewardship. As we do that, I want to share a couple things with you by way of kind of introducing this. Um, tomorrow, Sherry and I will be celebrating 35 years of marriage together. And she still tells me that I know nothing about marriage. <laughs> no, that's not true. But what, what I have discovered is this, is that the longer I'm married, the more that I know and, and, and realize that in those early days when I thought I knew a lot about marriage, I knew nothing. Well, I shouldn't say nothing, but I knew very little, and okay? not as much as I thought I knew. And God, through 35 years, has taught me a lot of things of, uh, about marriage. And a lot of, I haven't uh, necessarily accomplished all of those things. Right, dear? Yes. <clears throat> but there, there, are, there are many things that, that God has taught me along the way. And, and one of those things that he's taught both of us, we were talking about this the other night, is that how we both are responsible to be stewards of this marriage, to be managers of this marriage to both input and, and to, to help each other become complete. That's what God has given uh, each of us to each other for, was to become more mature and complete and not lacking in anything as a husband and wife. And for 35 years, we've been on that journey. And, and, and so I, I tell you that story to, to just highlight this issue of, of how Everything that we have comes from God. Whether we're talking about our marriage, we're talking about our possessions, we're talking about opportunities, we're talking about responsibilities. These all come from God. Back when I was in college, I think it was my second year in college, I was about 19. And I, I, I attended the local junior college, which I did, Joe would appreciate this, I attended the local junior college for eight years. Now, to be fair, I got my AA after two years. So I took another six years to figure out what AA meant. That's, that's what that was for. Now, I, I kept taking classes because I, I just kind of, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And so I, I was just trying to figure it out. You know, junior college is a great place to try and figure that out. And taking these different classes and a bunch of different things. I wouldn't trade those eight years for anything. I learned a lot of things, and it was really cool. I, I, I enjoyed that. But in the course of that, and the other responsibilities came. And what used to happen up to that point is my parents, my brother and I, um, about twice a year, we would take off and go to their cabin and property in Idaho. Sometimes for a couple of weeks, we'd go for a couple of months. And usually about every summer, we might go for about maybe six to eight weeks. My dad was self-employed, so he could afford to do that. A contractor, he made good money back in those days. It didn't, didn't matter. He could take that off. He could also work up there. It, didn't, it was a win-win. But this particular year, I, I couldn't go with them. I had work responsibilities. I was taking some summer classes at the junior college, and I, I needed to continue with those. And so they left, 19-year-old at home, all alone. Now... I had grown up in that home, obviously, and I knew what my parents expected of me in that home. I knew what my parents expected me to do in that home. I knew the chores that had to be done. I knew when they had to be done. I knew the stuff that needed and how it needed to look and everything else that it was to be. So they left. And I decided, oh, you know, the lawn doesn't need mowed this week. I'll wait a week. Ah, you know what? I'll, that bathroom can wait another week. I'll get to that. I started putting things off like that. And a week turned into two weeks, turned into four weeks, turned into six weeks. And it dawned on me two days Coming up, my parents were coming home in two days. <laughs> Lawn. That they spent years cultivating needed to be mowed. So I'm rushing around frankly. I'm trying to do I'm pulling all the weeds. I'm mowing the lawn. I'm cleaning the house. I'm putting all the stuff where it back. Everything where it had to be and all this stuff. I was so proud of myself because it looked so much better than it did. 
but it didn't look like what they left. And when they came home, they were not very happy with me. They were disappointed. Because what they had left me in charge to be a manager of, I did not do. I failed in that responsibility, and I couldn't claim ignorance. I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew how to do it. I had done it for nearly 14 years, at least, up to that point. And so I, I knew what was required. But I had other interests in my heart and mind that I wanted to pursue. And in doing that, I failed to be a good manager of all that my parents had left me to do. I was not a good steward, a good manager of what they entrusted to me. It was not my stuff. They gave it to me. They entrusted me to take care of it. And that's what God has done with each one of us. Jesus is no longer here. He's gone on and he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Before he left, he said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to be with you and in you, and he's going to guide you in all these things. Oh, and by the way, here are some things that I want you to continue on doing. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to continue in the ministry of reconciliation. You're going to be a manager of that. My Spirit's going to empower you to do that. You're going to be a witness in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. Remember that word, your oikos? You're going to be a witness in that. And I'm leaving you to manage those affairs by the power of my Holy Spirit. And so we're going to look at what it means to be a good steward, a good manager of what God has left to us. Six principles that I find in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. Let's define this term, stewardship, and that's what I'm calling our big idea for this morning, is this. Charlie, I think you need to click on my thing so it'll go. Is it? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So the, the, I'll see if it works again here in a minute. Uh, the big idea is this. Stewardship, it is utilizing and managing all the resources God provides for the glory of God and the furthering of his kingdom. It amounts to doing what matters. Go ahead and go back one. This is not working. You know, technology is a wonderful thing when it works, right? And, and this is not her fault. We're having a problem with this little thing here. So, yeah, problem. It could be. Anyway. Anyhow, we'll just go with this. We can work together, right, Charlotte? We can do this, right? Good. All right, here we go. So, big idea. Stewardship is utilizing and managing all the resources God provides for the glory of God and the furthering of his kingdom. It's doing what matters for eternal purposes, results in an abundant life in Christ, and it's making a kingdom difference. We need to keep these things in perspective as we look through these six principles. There are three principal players in this. As, as we go forward here. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The three principal players are this. There's the master. He represents Jesus. Here the master's getting ready to go on a journey, and, and as he gets ready to go, he's going to leave everything that he has with his servants. The servants in this represent the visible church. They are the ones who, who are... Uh, of us who, who know Jesus and we've assembled here. If you look to your right, you look to your left, you look to the people in front of you and back of you, that's the church. It's not this building. The church is a body. It's made up of many parts. It's made up of people with differing gifts and abilities and personalities. And, and so the servants represent the church. The talents represent our time, our gifts, our treasures, and our opportunities. Now as we look at these six principles. I want you to keep this thought in mind. We just sang the song called Inside Out. And that song is, the gist of that song is talking about the fact that it's not about doing things on the outside to look like Jesus. That is the essence of who we are in our, in, in our salvation. But it's rather having a relationship inside and, 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 and letting that relationship well up and change the outside of who we are and how we express that. It is, it is taking on the very nature of who Jesus is and letting him mold us into his image. 
not just trying to wear a coat that kind of looks like Jesus, and then when we're done, we take it off, and there's been no heart transformation inside. We need to understand that just doing these principles on the outside is not going to change anything about what we do and how we function as good stewards. It needs to flow out of our relationship with him. And so the first principle is found in verse 14, and it's this. All that we have is the master's, even our very lives. Verse 14 of chapter 25 says this. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Now, what does and again mean? Well, before that, he's been talking about the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven will be like. And he starts to talk about some different uh, illustrations about what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like. And here now he's talking about the kingdom of heaven is going to be like a man who got ready to go on a journey and went away for a while. And that's what Jesus has done. Jesus has finished, had finished his work on earth for three and a half years, and then he has left us here with his Holy Spirit to continue the work that he started. But he's coming back, and he's going to come back and ask, what did you do with what I left you? What did you do with what I've given you? How, how did you honor me in the life that I blessed you with? Second Chronicles 29.14 says this. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Everything that we have, our time, our talents, our treasures, our jobs, our homes, our children, our spouses, they all come from God. God has blessed us with each and every one of those things. And we need to appreciate that. We need to understand that. We need to embrace that. That every good and perfect gift has come, gift has come from him. Even our very lives, every breath we breathe is because of him. So we need to start there. That we own nothing. We're simply stewards of what the master has. The second principle is this. The master gives talents to each of us according to our abilities in differing measures. The master gives talents to each of us according to our abilities in differing measures. Verses 15 through 18 of chapter 25. To one he gave five talents and of money, to another he gave two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also the one with two talents gained two more. Let's stop there. So here he is. He, he had, he has, the, the master goes on his journey and he gives different amounts of money to each servant according to the ability they had to be able to invest this. One, he knew that he can handle five talents, so he gives him five talents and he knows he's going to do what he, with it he's supposed to do. And the second one, three, and, and, and then the or two, and then the, and then the last one, one. This is what God does with us. He gives to each of us differing talents, time, treasures, responsibilities. He doesn't give it the same way, and therefore it is, it is not up to me to judge Aaron and what Jer Aaron has in his life and the things he's to be responsible for and say, oh, well, Aaron, you're not using your time the way I use mine, therefore you're not doing it right. Just like he's not to do it with me. His responsibility is the time God has entrusted him, and he's accountable to one person, and it's not me. He's accountable to God for that. I'm accountable to God for my time. You're accountable to God for your time. We're accountable to God for our wealth, for our treasures, for our, for our marriages, for raising our children, for all of these things. We are accountable to him. He has left us those things on loan to manage while he is gone. And a day is coming when he's going to come back and say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with those things? How did you manage those? Show me. The master gives talents to each one according to our abilities and differing measures. Principle three is this. The manager 
expects his talents to be used and rewards those who use their talents for his kingdom purposes. In verse 19 through 23, we read this. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled the accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought, them, brought him another five and said, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Verse 22. The man with two talents also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two talents. See, I have gained two more. The master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The master expects the talents to be used and rewards those who use their talents for his kingdom, for kingdom purposes. Here are the two servants. They knew what their master did with the money. They had been with him. They knew how he functioned. They knew how he behaved. And so they took what he had left with them and they, and they invested it in the bank like he would have. And the, and the consequence was there was a return on that investment. And when he returned, they showed him the investment. And, and, and he was happy with them because they did what he would have done. Unlike me, when I didn't mow my parents' lawn and keep up their house and things like it needed to be done in timely fashion, I, I knew it needed to be done, but I chose to not do it for whatever reason. I disappointed them. These servants did what their master expected, and, and he was pleased because he, he entrusted them with it, and they followed through. They did what they needed to do. It's important to realize here that when God calls you and I to use and to, to manage these talents and time and treasures, that we are to do so not for self-glorification, but for the furthering of his kingdom, to glorify him. Matthew 5.16 tells us that we are to let our light shine before men in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify me. No, it doesn't say that. It says to glorify our Father who is in heaven. Colossians 3 tells us, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all to the glory of God. And so we need, we must grasp this concept that, that as we manage these resources that God has left us, that we need to do so to his glory and honor, not to edify us, not to make us look better. but to advance the kingdom of Christ. Principle number four is this. There are consequences to be experienced when talents are hidden. Verses 26 and 27 say this. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant, you knew that I harvest... No, excuse me, back up. Then the man who had, verse 24, then the man who had one talent came, Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here it is, what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather seed where I have not scattered seed. Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the banker so that when I return, it would have received it back with interest. There's consequences when, when God entrusts us with things and we choose to hide them. Just like there were consequences for me when I chose to not do my parents' will for whatever reason that it was. It took a long time for them to trust me again when they said, Can, will you take care of this for us? And they always had a hesitation. They didn't know if I'd follow through with that. And, and I was, frankly, at that age in my life, I was a little bit like, what's the big deal? Your house is still standing. I didn't burn it down. <laughs> it's here. This is what that servant did. Here's your talent. It, here it is right here. It's just like what you gave me. I didn't, I didn't mess it up. I didn't lose it. It's right here. 
And the master says, but you know what I wanted you to do with it, and you didn't do it. How would it be when we stand before Jesus and he says, so Bob, what did you do with that whole goal of making disciples? Which I kind of, by the way, I think it's kind of a dumb question because Jesus already know what I did with that, but he's going to ask anyway. What did you do in making disciples? What did you do with your faith and sharing your faith? Is it going to go well if I say to Jesus, well, here's my faith. I didn't share it because I was afraid I'd mess it up. I was afraid I might say the wrong thing. And so, so here it is. I, I, didn't, I didn't say the wrong thing, and I didn't say something theologically incorrect. Here it is. What's his answer you think going to be? You can fill in the blank, and you can add other things into there about what Jesus might ask us. Because Scripture does tell us that there is going to be an account that each of us is going to have to give. I don't pretend to know how that works out. I just know that it says there's going to be an account. And God's mercy and grace is going to figure into that somehow too and all of that. But there, there's going to be an account. What's the answer that we want to give? Because he already knows the answer. We can't lie our way out of that. He's going to know the answer. Sometimes... We take our time and our opportunities and our investments or treasures and we hide them or we hoard them because we're afraid of losing them and they're not ours to lose to begin with. It all comes from God. Yes, we have to be managers of our time and yes, we have to be managers of our money and yes, we have to be managers of our household. But to simply do nothing because we're afraid we might mess it up is not an option. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4 tell us what we're supposed to do. It says, Do nothing out of a selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look out only to your own interests. Okay, my own interest is I don't want to mess it up and I want to save face, so I'm not going to do anything with this. But also look out for the interests of others. Your attitude should be to that as the same in Christ Jesus. And it goes on from verse 5 on to explain what Christ did in emptying himself and going to the cross in your place and in my place. That's the kind of attitude we're supposed to have with all this stuff. The fifth principle is this. The master wants us with, trusts us with, excuse me, the master wants us to work with others, if necessary, to take advantage of opportunities. This is found in verse 27. Here, the, the, the um, master says to the slave, if you would have taken my money and, and put it into the bank where it could gain interest with the investors, that would have been a good thing, but you didn't do that. We don't need to handle our responsibilities on our own. Yes, God's given us his Holy Spirit to empower us to do this and, and to follow through on the commitments and responsibilities he's given us, but he's also given us each other. He's given us each other to help in this journey. You have gifts and abilities and experiences that, that can help me in my journey and vice versa. And we need to, we need to embrace that all the more. There's, there, there are other people out there outside the walls of this church family that, that can bless us that way and take the journey with us as well, and that we can help in their journey as well. We do not have to just try and do this on our own. Ephesians chapter 4 tells us that the body of Christ becomes more mature and complete as each part does its work. 1 Corinthians 12, you know the passage well, talks about the church being like, the, like a body, like a physical body. And, and to each one, there are some that are hands, there are some are feet, there are some that are eyes, there are some that are mouths, and etc. And, and not everybody is just a hand, not everybody is just an eye, because it takes all of the parts of our body to make this thing work and function. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 tell us, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together is the habit of some. Tells us that for a reason, because we need to help each other in this journey. 
We need to help each other manage these resources that God has left to us. And, and, and that help may take the form of just encouragement. It may take the help, a form of prayer. It may take the form of, of confrontation. It, it may take the, the, the form of, 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 of gentle rebuke and encouragement. But we need to realize that God has left us that blessing of each other as well, as a family, to take this journey together. Principle number six is this. That the master trusts us more as we are faithful with what we have been entrusted. In verses 28 through 30, Jesus says in the parable that the master then takes what, the one talent from the servant who didn't do anything with it and he gave it to the one who had five. And he, he got more because he was faithful with what he had done. That doesn't mean that the one with two didn't necessarily get anything. It doesn't tell us. We don't know. It's just that's where it went. The, the fact of the matter is that as we are faithful with a little bit, then God increases it. Because I think if he gave us all of this to, to try to be faithful with at one time, it'd overload us. We'd kind of short circuit. It'd be too much. And, and so he gives us only what we can handle. Scripture tells us about that, by the way. He only gives us as much as we can bear. And, and so here is the master giving a little more to the one at five because he was trustworthy. The one with one was not trustworthy. He knew his, he knew his master's will, but he failed to do it. There's another principle that I didn't put up on the screen, but it's kind of implied in all of these, is this, is that to do what God wants you to do and me to do with our time, talents, and treasures and responsibilities, we can't fail. Sometimes we're afraid to do something because we're afraid we're going to fail because we're afraid to mess it up. In God's economy, we will not fail. Yeah, we may not get it right. There's a difference. But doing God's will and, and then it not turning out exactly the way we think doesn't mean it didn't turn out the way God wanted it to turn out. That makes sense. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. That's where that comes into play. And don't use that as an excuse, by the way. Oh, well, I, was, I just did this because, you know, it was what it was, and it was a stupid thing. But you know what? God will make it work out. It's not a good idea. This parable... Jesus is telling his disciples, and only to us, because he wants us to understand that in this world, we're going to get distracted. There's going to be things that, that want to, to clamor for our attention. And he wants us to understand that what we value in this life is going to tell us exactly where our heart is. How we manage things and what we invest things into is going to reveal exactly where our heart is. If you value your money and things, and you invest your money, for example, in Microsoft or in Apple, we'll be fair, do both platforms here, you're going to have an interest in what happens with that money, and you're going to want to see the returns on it and see what it does. If you invest it in General Electric, you want to see where that's going. On, on, it goes. If you invest your money in the kingdom, into different uh, causes, missionary causes, the church, or whatever it might be, you're interested to see what happens with that. At least I hope you are. What, what does God do with what I've got here? Scripture tells us this in Matthew 6, verse 21. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? That's where your heart's going to be. As we, as we look at these resources that God has left us to be managers of. We have two ways we can do this. Our lives are like a dot. And this dot represents our life here on earth. And we can make all the decisions about that. 
in, in regard to just what we see on the horizontal plane on this earth. Or we can realize that from that dot goes an arrow out, and it's called eternity. It's all that God is. He surpasses all the time. This is, this is eternity perspective, the kingdom perspective. And we can make decisions based on the kingdom perspective. How does this help people know Jesus, what I'm about to do? With my time, my talents, my treasures, my opportunities, how is this going to make Jesus known? Remember, this is an inside-out approach. We, we have to have a relationship with Jesus if this is going to happen, because if, if we're not cultivating that relationship, we can't understand the kingdom part of this. We can't understand this part of it. Mark 4, verses 1 through 20, is the parable of sower. Many of you know it. But in that parable, Jesus said, the cares of this life choke out the abundant life that Jesus wants to bring us. And, and so we need, if we take a kingdom perspective, we guard against the things of this world choking it out. And, and we start saying, hey, okay, Lord, first of all, it's all from you to begin with. You've given it all to me. It's my job to manage it. It's my job to be a steward of it. So, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? How do you want me to handle this? And that means we have to know him too, right? We've got to know his character. We've got to know how he, how, how he encourages us and how his commands and the things that he has there, his, his, his ways and means, because he reveals that in the word. It's there. The more we get to know him, the more we get to know his ways. We also need to remember that the Lord is the one who has given us the ability to have the things that multiply. We, we weren't so smart that we managed to multiply some things and do some things. It's God who has given us this ability. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 17 and 18 say this. You may say to yourself, my power and strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me, but remember the Lord your God. For it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so confirms his covenant, which he swore to your ancestors as it is today. I think part of the lesson of this parable is, too, that, that Jesus wants us to remember that, again, it's, it's not anything that we've done. It's all come from God. Even the ability we've had to manage something and do it, it all comes from him. We're not so smart that we can figure all this out on our own. Everything that we have comes from him. And when we seek to try to manage these resources as well, as well, it's easy to forget where we're actually living. So you realize this isn't your home, right? If you're a Christian, this world is not your home. We're simply visiting. Okay? And we forget that, because we get caught up in all the stuff that goes around, and sometimes we forget. And God knows that. I mean, he's a gracious God, and he forgives. That's, that's fine. But we can't, we can't stay there. We have to remember that we are ambassadors here. Second Corinthians chapter 5, Paul tells us that we're ambassadors on this earth, and that we are representing Christ, that we're continuing the ministry of reconciliation that Jesus started. Reconciling people to God, finding lost sheep is another way to say it. Paul tells in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship is not here, it's in heaven above. So we're just visiting. Final destination is yet to be reached. And so while we're here, we need to represent our king. We need to represent his interests. We need to be managing the resources he has left for us to manage according to his good and perfect will. Time, treasure, talents, monies, abilities, all of it, relationships. We need to manage all of that according to his will. Now this may all seem to be a bit overwhelming. I want you to remember three things here as we close this out. And it's kind of what I call an umbrella kind of principle. And the first one is found in Acts, chapter 1, verses 10 through 11. 
they're standing there and they're looking up. Jesus is ascending and they're looking like, where's he going? What, what, what's going on? He's just here. He just gave us what, what's going on. And then some angels appear and they say, men of Galilee, why are you standing there looking like that? This same Jesus that you see going, he's going to return the same way. In other words, Jesus is coming back. Just like the master in the parable came back, Jesus is coming back. And he's going to be asking for an account, what did you do with what I left you? What did you do with what I left you? The second thing is this, Philippians 4.13, that we can do all things through him who gives us strength. Managing these resources that God has left for us, time, talents, treasures, and opportunities, is not impossible through God. Nothing is impossible through him. And so we can do all things through him who gives us strength. And that kind of strength is described for us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, when Peter writes this. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And the word for power there is the word dunamis, and it's the, it's the descriptive power, that same power that, that raised Jesus from the dead. That same power is at work in us through the Holy Spirit to accomplish his will, his way, in his time on this earth. We just need to embrace it. As the worship team comes forward, let me close this with this. Our big idea was this. That stewardship is utilizing and managing all the resources God provides for the glory of God and the furthering of his kingdom. It involves doing what matters for eternal purposes, Results in an abundant life in Christ that Jesus describes for us in John 10, 10. And it's making a kingdom difference. Making a kingdom difference. In your bulletin is an insert, something that I, I want to give to you for further study on this idea of stewardship. And it involves getting to know this... Uh, resource here called Right Now Media. Now some of you are aware of it. We've had this for a while in church. It's a training opportunity for you to, to go online in the church library and, and check out some different uh, discipleship materials and, and uh, training materials on, on things like parenting and marriage and family. And we were, we were getting ready to actually cancel this because of the budget crisis thing, not crisis, but the budget crunch that we're kind of in here at the church. Expenses are a little higher than income, so we've had to kind of cut back on some things. And this is one of the things we were going to get rid of. And when I called the, the organization to, to uh, cancel the subscription, um, they said, well, how about if we give you three months free? No, I don't want three months free. No. So I, I, we have another three and a half months on this, and, and at that time we'll you know, take a look at it and we'll see how we're doing. But it, I, I love this resource. I think, it's, I think it's a great thing. But if it's not something that's serving us, then we won't continue it after November 8th. But I encourage you to go and check it out. And they've actually made it real simple now. You can go, if you have a cell phone and know how to do this, um, you can actually scan the QR code that's on this, and it'll, the website will come right up on your cell phone. Hit that. It'll take you to a link where you can sign right up. You don't even have to involve me anymore in the process. Okay? Used to be you had to send me an email saying, we'd like to join the thing. And I would be like, hmm. But you don't have to do that anymore. Okay? So you just go on there and you sign up. And then they shoot me a little note saying, hey, you've signed up. Okay, cool. If you're not very um, tech savvy like that, and oh, it's a QR code. That's what that thing is. Okay? I have right next to the QR code the URL web address. You can type that in your web browser and go there and it will run you through the same process and you can do all that. And then, once you're there and logged in and you're able to get to the site, you click on in the upper right hand, uh, upper left hand corner rather, of the, um, of the menu and it says libraries, click libraries and scroll down to says Trinity Alliance Church, click Trinity Alliance Church and you will find some studies on there that um, I have put on there that I'm recommending for you to follow up. One of them is on marriage and love and respect. Uh, some of you that did the seminar, those resources are on there, and the, the more broader love and respect category is there as well. It doesn't cost you anything to look at these videos. It doesn't cost you anything to download the small group study guides. It only costs if you want to download the workbook or if you want to download a leader guide, but it costs you nothing to watch these videos and, and to go through and all this. So you can click that. If you don't have a good web, um, a uh, good web provider and whatnot. We have, a, we have a pretty good one here now. You're welcome to come here to the church. I'll get you on a computer and you can do it here. But 
All that to say this, one of those things in the library is uh, it's Randy Alcorn's The Treasure Principle. And he goes through there and talks about six uh, points of stewardship. Not only money, but also all these other things we've been talking about this morning. And it'll take you deeper into what we've been talking about this morning. And so your homework, never thought you'd get homework out of a sermon, did you? <laughs> your homework is to go look that up. And they're only, the videos are only 17 minutes long. Four of them, okay? Doesn't take very long. So 17 minutes, less than, than, a, than a, uh, half of a movie, okay? And just go and, 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 and just see what God has to say to you through that. That's your follow-up to this as well. I hope you'll do that.